All right, what is going on, everyone? This is Eric coming at you from just outside of Connecticut, and for the first time in a while, we are live. Always exciting to be back. And as I mentioned last week during my update update video, um, this is going to be the return of the History of series. Now, it won't be as frequent as it was before, where it was every single Friday I uploaded a video. It's not going to be like that anymore. It's going to be a little longer for the history of videos to be recorded and all that. Um, I say in every uh, description, they take a long time to record or, you know, do the research for. It takes hours. So um, I'm just going to kind of have to take it easier on them. And hopefully we get to at least having one, maybe two a month. So it's going to be fun. We are excited to get back into the series here. Um, so without further ado, I suppose I'll jump right in. So as you can tell by the title, this is going to be the history of the Boston Red Sox. So I've actually recorded this video a couple times beforehand, but each time we did have technical problems uploading the video. Um, I tried to post this back in July in all honesty, and it took way too long to upload it. And... I couldn't do a live stream. My computer was acting up, but it's working now. It's letting me do live streams. So we are coming back in, do this. I know it's been a while. I've missed you guys, followers of the History of series. It's definitely been a, it's definitely been a long time coming. Um, as you can tell, obviously, there's no camera today. It'll, it'll come back on soon. Don't worry. It's just right now. I can't really work with the camera just because of lighting and everything like that. But without further ado, we will definitely jump into this video. And you're going to notice that while the Red Sox are definitely one of the more storied franchises in the league, there are some decades that nothing really happened for them. And remember, as I've said before, when it comes to the history of series, we don't really discuss individual achievements. That would be its own separate video in player bios. We discuss the team itself. We discuss players that come and go, but we don't discuss individual achievements. If player A has a batting triple crown, we might mention it. But if player A breaks the home run record for a single season, we're probably not going to mention it. But here we go. We'll start off with the Red Sox history. And of course, it's always exciting. So in the 1900s, remember, we go decade by decade here. In the 1900s, the Red Sox were actually founded as an original member of the American League in the year 1901. So at this point in time, they were the Boston Americans, not the Boston Red Sox. And they would play their home games originally at Huntington Avenue grounds. So it wasn't Fenway Park yet, but they played at the Huntington Avenue grounds. Now, early on, they were one of the strongest teams in the American League. Now, they had arguably the best pitcher of all time in Cy Young leading the way. And this is towards the end of his prime Cy Young. So he's still pretty good. And they had third baseman Jimmy Collins, and they had a good trio of outfielders as well, and Chick Stahl, Patsy Duttery, and uh, Buck Freeman. So they had a pretty talented core going in to their start in the American League. And they would win the AL pennant in the year 1903. And in 1903, we get our first ever World Series, as we know it today. So, of course, the AL winner, Boston Red Sox, would take on the NL winning Pittsburgh Pirates. And the Pirates were heavily favored. At this point in time, everyone thought the NL was a, the far superior league. Everyone's like, okay, the NL is the real deal. The AL is just the, you know, the sibling, the little child. And the Red Sox end up taking the World Series in eight games, five games to three. So at this point in time, the World Series was a best of nine, and the Red Sox took it five games to three. So they shocked the world by defeating the Pittsburgh Pirates in the World Series, in the first ever World Series in 1903. So after this, they end up trading away Patsy Dotery to the Highlanders, who would become the New York Yankees. And then we get to the next year, 1904, and the Americans have another really good season. They win the AL pennant once again, but this time the World Series is not played. Now, this is because the NL champions were the New York Giants, and 
they had a thought that the Highlanders would win the American League because the Highlanders were in the lead coming down the stretch. So when they clinched, they said, we're not going to play the World Series. Now, the fear was they didn't want to play the World Series because if they played the uh, Highlanders in the World Series, it would give legitimacy to the Highlanders in the American League. And remember, they're in direct competition with the Highlanders for fans. So if you give legitimacy, and let's just say the Highlanders pulled the upset, that's embarrassing, and you're going to lose a good portion of your fans because they're going to say, you know what? This team's better than you. They have a World Series. You don't. So they were afraid of that, and they just didn't do it. So after this non-World Series being played year 1904, the Americans began to struggle, and they struggled through the 1907 season. They did get a bit of a break, though, in 1907, when outfielder Tris Speaker would make his MLB debut for the ball club. So prior to the 1908 season, the team would effectively change its name from the Boston Americans to the Boston Red Sox. And uh, it became a name that would stick, obviously. So in 1908, pitcher Smokey Joe Wood would make his debut for the ball club. And the team still struggled. In 1908, but at least now some they're getting some young talent to come into the ball club. So they would trade away Cy Young to the Cleveland Naps prior to the 1909 season, just kind of getting him another chance to go back home because at this point Cy Young's washed up. He's he's not good anymore. And their thought process was, you know, he was from Cleveland originally. Send him back to the home. He wanted to be back in Hong Cleveland, so they just they obliged. You know, you want you want to do that when you have an all time player on your team. If he wants to go, you let him go, especially towards the end of his career. So in 1909, the Red Sox, their fortunes began to change, and they started to look good again. Now, they didn't win the AL that year, but the, the future was looking good. So in the 1900s, the Red Sox won two, NL, two AL pennants, sorry, and uh, they won the one World Series they competed in in 1903. However, the 1904 World Series, as we mentioned before, was not played. Therefore, they went 1-0 in the World Series with their two AL pennants. So now we get to the 1910s. And in the start of the 1910s, the team was okay. They weren't dominant, but that's because the Yankees at this point and the Athletics and the White Sox were all really good in the early 1910s. So the Red Sox just kind of fell behind because of the extreme talent. Now, they still had a lot of talent themselves, but we get to the 1912 season, and the Red Sox officially moved to the brand new Fenway Park. Kind of crazy to say brand new Fenway Park, but this is 1912. They moved to Fenway Park. And they still play there today, as you know. Um, I'm sure if you're from the area in the New England, like we are, based here in Hartford, Connecticut, you've probably been to Fenway at one point or another. Very beautiful ballpark. I just wish the seats were a little bigger. But, you know, the Red Sox, 1912, they had an amazing season. They would actually win 105 games, which is their second most in franchise history. Now, they played less games back then, so that's pretty impressive. And they did get their franchise best win percentage with a 691 win percentage. So they won the AL pennant, and then they made the World Series, and they would play the New York Giants. And they beat the New York Giants. So then they get an interesting trade in mid-1914 which would see them, you know, they would trade. What they traded varies. It's cash, that much we know. But the popular consensus is they've traded $25,000 to a minor league affiliation uh, ball club called the Baltimore Orioles. There is no connection between the New York Yankees and the Baltimore Orioles like we saw at one point in time. And there's no connection between the modern-day Baltimore Orioles and this Baltimore Orioles. And there's no connection between this Baltimore Orioles team and the St. Louis Browns, it's just they're just a minor league affiliation, no connections to anything like that. But they traded, like I said, it varies on who you ask, but the popular consensus is $25,000 to that minor league affiliation for a pitcher named Babe Ruth. Now, when Babe Ruth started making his time in Boston, um, he kind of made a lot of guys mad, a lot of the veterans mad, because he demanded, he didn't just ask, he demanded to become a hitter. He wanted to hit. And a lot of the veterans were saying, wow, this guy's just being rude. He's demanding this. He's demanding that. And he's a rookie. So they hazed him and he did not like that. Babe Ruth did not like that at all. But he had to deal with it. 
So here we are, and we get to the 1915 season, and the team is becoming very good. So they went back-to-back World Series in 1915-1916, partly because of the strong power hitting and pitching of Babe Ruth and just everyone really clicking, Trish Speaker, all of them. So the 1917, we have an interesting season. And then 1918, they come back. And 1917 was um, actually the White Sox winning the World Series. 1918, we get the Red Sox back on top of the world, winning the World Series yet again in a bit of a weird 1918 season that saw the teams really lose some players due to World War One. So, but Boston came out on top. 1919, the White Sox, very good season again pushed Boston down. At this point, Chicago and Boston are fighting for the one spot with the Yankees slowly starting to creep up on them. So in the 1910s, the Red Sox would win four AL pennants and all four of the World Series that they competed in, which of course are 1912, 1915, 1916, and 1918. So now we get to the 1920s. And a bit of an infamous moment happens right at the start of the decade when on January 2nd, 1920, the Red Sox would trade away Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees for $100,000 in cash. Now, people say he traded Babe Ruth for his theater or whatever, uh, for his Broadway play. I, I don't buy that. You know, at that point in time, players were traded for cash all the time. And Babe Ruth was a bit of a cancerous player in the clubhouse. Um, that would continue that started before his time in Boston that would continue through his time in Boston and it would continue outside of Boston. So it's not like it was just Boston. So it, you know, I can understand that. And he was big, starting to make big salary demands and this is shortly after world war one. So not everyone had money. So obviously he gets straight to the Yankees and this is when the curse of the Bambino sets in. So the 1920s saw Boston just really struggle. Their owner would start to have financial problems right off the bat. And what ended up happening is he started to have to trade most of his star players to the Yankees because they wanted to trade most of their star players to the White Sox. But the White Sox had been struck by their own scandal. And there was actually an offer on the table, Babe Ruth for Shuley Joe Jackson. And the only reason they didn't take that offer is because he needed the money. So it just goes to show you. And then, of course, the scandal sets in, and Shula Show Jackson would have been banned for life. So Boston ends up, no matter what, they would have lost the trade. But um, it just, you know, it, it just became a point where Boston had to trade their star players to the Yankees for okay players and role players and guys who were past their prime and then cash. And for the most part, the Yankees would cover the cash in like the player salary. So let's just say a guy was owed. $6,000, the Yankees would put forth 4500 or $5,000 and just pay him to play in Boston because he was done. He was washed up. So this really hurt Boston, obviously. Anytime they had a good young player, they had to trade him because they couldn't pay him. And the team was okay record-wise in the early part of the decade, but you know, as more and more players had to be traded for cash and worse players, the team started to fall off. And towards the, bot, the back end of the decade, the team just really bottomed out. So in the 1920s, the team won no AL pennants. Now we get to the 30s, and the team's downward spiral really did continue through the 30s, which included a franchise worst 43 win, 111, wa- 111 loss season in the year of 1932. So in 1933, Tom Yawkey would purchase the team. Finally, an owner that we know to date. And the team would begin to acquire assets after the 1933 season, which included some key players in pitcher Lefty Grove, first baseman Jimmy Fox, and shortstop Joe Cronin. So the team was better as the decade got on in the 30s, but they weren't great. Part of that's because the Yankees were just a complete dominant force. And uh, the Red Sox end up acquiring outfielder Ted Williams prior to the 1939 season. So they won no pennants in the 1930s, so obviously no World Series. Now we get to the 40s. And the 40s were definitely a very interesting decade for Boston and the world. So as we know, World War II happens. And Ted Williams, you know, he proves to be a superstar, though. So in 1941, Ted Williams bats 406. This is the last time someone batted 400 in a single season. 
you know, of course, with qualified at bats. So not doing three at bats and hitting two for three. Um, so he, like I said, that's the last time a guy hit over 400 in a single season. And in May of 1942, Ted Williams would actually join the U.S. Naval Reserve, and he ends up not playing. He ends up leaving in mid 1942, and he doesn't come back until the 1946 season. So he missed a, a chunk of his prime. But he, he enlisted, he fought overseas. And in 1946, the team responds well. So led by Ted Williams, alongside a contact hitting shortstop named Johnny Pesky, whom the Pesky Pole is named after, and uh, Dom DiMaggio, who's actually Joe DiMaggio's brother, the Red Sox would make the 1946 World Series, but they would lose. And then this team remained good. And then in 1948... In 1949, the team suffered more heartbreak. In 1948, they would lose a one-game playoff to Cleveland, which gave Cleveland the AL pennant. In 1949, the team got swept in a doubleheader by the New York Yankees to end the season, which pushed them a half game behind the Yankees. So they lost the AL pennant yet again in a sad, gut-wrenching fashion. So in the 1940s, the team would win one AL pennant, but they did not win the World Series unfortunately for them. Now we get the 1950s and the 50s started off rough. It just, it just wasn't a good decade. Um, a lot of their key players from the late forties were starting to get older. And Ted Williams was actually drafted again to fight in the Korean war from May of 1952 until August of 1953. Now, unlike world war II, he didn't want to fight in the Korean war, but because he had joined the U S Naval reserves, they drafted him. So he wasn't happy to be going overseas. It's not like he said, this team sucks. I'm going to go overseas. No, that's not what happened. He was drafted to go overseas. And uh, the team he returned to after just a year off was completely different. So they had, you know, most of the stars had left and they had been traded for cash considerations or, you know, they had retired. So basically, um, there was a little nickname that would go around and they, they call it the Red Sox at this point in time, Ted Williams and the Seven Dwarfs. Remember, at this point in time, Snow White's become so popular. So he just had a really tough time. And the Red Sox, this is a bit of a little uh, scandalous part in their history. The biggest black eye, arguably, in the Red Sox history. They were the last team in Major League Baseball to field an African-American player, which would occur in 1959 when they promoted an infielder by the name of Pupsy Green. So again, this is a big scandalous part of the Red Sox history. And it's actually why a lot of people are taught, like, that's why they had to rename Yawkey Way in Boston. Um, it's the biggest critique on Tom Yawkey by far. So they did not win any pennants in the 1950s. So now we get to the 1960s. And in 1960, after the 1960 season, Ted Williams would retire. However, Boston got extremely lucky as 1961 another really young, really talented outfielder named Carl Yastrzemski would make his MLB debut. So all of a sudden, you lose Ted Williams, but you gain Yastrzemski, whom I may be calling Yaz from here on out. It depends. But um, he did good, and the team was pretty quiet until you get to 1967. And in 1967, the season was known as the impossible dream to Red Sox fans. So Yastrzemski helped to carry the team through a crowded, extremely talented American league. So basically this league, this year, 1967, saw the AL just have four super strong, top-heavy, competitive teams. I think it was the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Tigers, and the White Sox. So all these teams are right up there competing until the very end. And uh, basically all four teams were competing until the last couple of games. And what ends up happening is the Red Sox come out on top and they win that extremely crowded American League. So Yastrzemski won the AL Triple Crown, batting Triple Crown, in that year of 1967. And this helped carry the team from a ninth place finish in 1966 to the first place AL finish in 1967. So in the World Series, though, the Red Sox lost in a seven-game fashion. So it was a real big eye-opener to Red Sox fans. They said, oh my gosh, this team actually has some talent. 
maybe we're ready to play. And the team remained kept competitive towards the end of the 60s, but they weren't good enough to compete for a World Series. They didn't make the World Series to close out the decade. So in the 60s, they made one World Series in which they lost. Now I get to the 70s. And in the early part of the 1970s, the team really did remain competitive. Now, they would finish a half game behind the Detroit Tigers in 1972, and this was due to a player strike, so the Tigers would win the AL that year. Um, By 1975, the Red Sox were starting to build a strong team yet again. Now, they had a pair of rookie outfielders that were very well known and regarded in Jim Rice and Fred Lynn. And the two of them, or Fred Lynn himself, he would actually go on to win the AL Rookie of the Year and MVP award in the same season. So in 1975, this year, the Red Sox would again make the World Series. And this would include a memorable Game 6 victory over the Cincinnati Reds. However, they would lose the series in seven to the Reds. So they had a strong 1977 season, and they were led by seven All-Stars that year. However, they missed the playoffs despite the fact that they had 97 wins. At this point in time, only one team would make the playoffs from the AL, only one team would make it from the NL. So they would end up trading for pitcher Dennis Eckersley from the Cleveland prior to the 1978 season. And the 1978 season saw another tough uh, loss in where they would lose a one-game playoff spot to their arch-rival New York Yankees, which, of course, is never fun, never easy to do. 1979, Carl Yastrzemski hits his 3,000th career hit. First guy to do it for Boston, so that's why I'm mentioning it. I know I said I won't really mention that kind of stuff, but... So, now... In the 1970s, the team won one AL pennant, but did not win the World Series. So now we get to the 80s, and the 80s were another interesting decade for them. And in the 1980s, the team started off playing very well, but it wasn't perfect. So um, they decided to save money and let some key players go. So one of these... A couple of these players were Fred Lynn and Carlton Fisk, the catcher. So Fisk walks, he goes to to Chicago, and he does really well over there. Chicago White Sox. Um, Yastrzemski would end up retiring after the 1983 season. So to put it nicely, basically the the, uh, Red Sox had a very, very strong pitching, or very, very strong Hall of Fame outfielder from 1940. From 1940, let me double check this real quick. Um, from 1939 until 1983, so 1939 to 1983, they had a Hall of Fame outfielder in their outfield hold four years due to wars. That's just insane. You know, that's something the Yankees would do. Extreme domination in the outfield. So what ends up happening is they would call up a young prospect pitcher named Roger Clemens in May of 1984. Now, at this point in time, Clemens wasn't a steroid user. He wasn't known as a steroid user. He was just an extremely talented player that a lot of people were excited about in Boston. So in 1986, the team had a very strong season as they were led by Roger Clemens, Jim Rice, Bill Buckner, and Wade Boggs. Now, you probably know where I'm going with this. So here they are, 1986 World Series. They won the American League again, and they're playing the New York Mets. So we got game six, and there's a very well-known, well-known error that happens here. So we get to this point, and it's, it's nothing crazy, but here it goes. So... Game six, we're going into extra innings. Game is tied at three a pop. Red Sox are up in the series three games to two. And the Red Sox end up taking a 5-3 lead in the 10th inning. So there's a slow ground ball hit to first base. Should have been a a routine ground ball to end end the game, end the series, essentially. 
And Bill Buckner misses it, misplays it, and it goes through his legs, goes into the outfield. So this is by far one of the most costly errors in Major League Baseball history. So, oh boy, I feel bad for Red Sox fans here. Um, the Mets go on to rally after this error, win the game, and then they go and take the momentum that they got from winning said game to Game 7, where they again win Game 7. And obviously, this really hurts all Red Sox fans. And Bill Buckner, never really the same after this. He really just kind of struggles. And he can't shake it off. He's still today known for his error. If I ask you who Bill Buckner is, you probably know him as the guy who committed the error in the 86 World Series. Up here, if you say the name Bill Buckner to anyone who's old enough, they shudder. So... The team ends up making the playoffs in 1988, but they fail to make an impact getting swept in the American League uh, Championship Series by the Oakland Athletics. So in the 1980s, the team won one AL pennant, but did not win any World Series. Now I get to the 90s, and the 90s were a tough decade for Boston fans. So they, uh, they get swept in the ALCS again by Oakland in 1990. And as the decade would, pro would progress, the Red Sox would start getting worse. So in the mid nineties, a player, you know, some key prospects, some key names would come up, including uh, shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra. Now Garcia Parra is one of the more underrated players in MLB history. And if you ask a lot of Boston fans, they're going to tell you he's a hall of famer, but outside of Boston, he doesn't really have a note, like a name. He doesn't have the name recognition. So, Clemens would actually end up walking from the team after the 1996 season. And around this time in 1997, the team would trade for a catching prospect named Jason Veritek and a pitcher in Derek Lowe. And then in 1998, they would acquire a starting pitcher named Pedro Martinez. Now, there was a game, 1999 ALDS, Game 4. The Red Sox would beat Cleveland in a butt-kicking 23-7 to fashion. Now, this is the highest scoring playoff game in MLB history to date as of recording prior to the 2020 MLB playoffs. And at the end of the 90s, things were definitely looking up for Boston. They had a lot of key pieces in place, but they weren't there yet, as you can expect. So we, we get to this point now where... It's the 2000s. There's no pennants won in the 90s. The team hasn't won a World Series since 1918. And in the year 2000, the Red Sox had a few individuals start to shine, but the team as a whole finished just above 500. Pedro Martinez had a remarkable 18-6 and record with a 1.74 ERA en route to a Cy Young Award. And they also had a career year from the shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra. So prior to the 2001 season, the Red Sox put a lot of money out and signed outfielder Manny Ramirez to an eight-year, $160 million deal. At this point in time, that's a massive, massive, massive contract. So now the Red Sox are really starting to look good. Really starting to look good. And the team ends up getting sold in 2002 to a group known as the New England Sports Ventures Group. And what they end up doing is they would sign an outfielder named Johnny Damon to a four-year contract prior to 2002. So at this point, they're starting to go out and uh, throw money around because Boston's finally competing. They're in, they got a new ownership group. They're ready to go. So what they end up doing, too, at this point is they try to get Billy Bean the general manager from the Oakland Athletics, to come over to Boston. They try to lure him over. They fail, so they go with their second option, and that is going to be Theo Epstein. So they hire Epstein as their GM. And they would sign a well-known free agent first baseman from Minnesota known as David Ortiz. Now, Ortiz had basically priced himself out of, out of uh, Minnesota. So because he knew a couple guys in the system in Boston, they were able to convince ownership to give him a shot. Ortiz comes over in 2003. The rest is history. Now, in 2003, in the ALCS, they make it to a Game 7, and they blow Game 7 to the Yankees 
in heartbreaking fashion. Now, prior to 2004, they would hire a manager, Terry Francona, to coach the team. And they would acquire a, a, an ace starting pitcher named Kurt Schilling, who had a very good 2001 season for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And he, he was looking so good, dominant, and they get him. So the team would end up trading away popular fan favorite Nomar Garcia Parra to the Chicago Cubs at the trade deadline. That's just a gut punch to any Red Sox fan because of what happens. So they end up sweeping Cleveland in the ALDS. And this is a series that made the Red Sox what they are today. 2004 ALCS. Yankees take a 3-0 series lead. And what ends up happening is the Yankees end up blowing that 3-0 series lead in a dramatic fashion. Boston takes the series four games to three. Ride the momentum, ride the hype to the World Series where they would play the St. Louis Cardinals. And in game six, though, of this ALCS, we have the Bloody Sock. Now, you might be wondering, what is the Bloody Sock if you're a young fan? Look it up. <clears throat> Basically, Kurt Schilling's pitching, marquee game, and they notice blood starting to pile up on a sock. It's in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame at this point in time. The bloody sock is a folklore up here in Connecticut. So, yeah, he, he pitched through a bad injury. Um, there are conspiracies going around that he planted the bloody sock, and it wasn't real. I don't buy that garbage. Um, you know, it, it's just it's a key moment in MLB history. I don't want to soil it, but I had to mention the conspiracy there. The bloody sock is one of the most well-known moments in the 2000s of MLB history. So... They end up playing the Cardinals in the World Series, and they end up sweeping the Cardinals four games to zero. Now, they were so excited. At this point, you're on an eight-game winning streak. You're pumped. You're ready to go. So this effectively would end the curse of the Bambino. And after the 2004 season, Pedro Martinez would walk from the team. So in 2005, they would make the World Series, and they were swept by the Chicago White Sox, who went on to end their own curse, their own, at this point, you know, 1919 to 2005. So really long curse again. Um, 1918, I should say. 1919, 1919. So what ends up happening is Jonathan Papelbon, John Lester, and Dustin Bedroya would all make their debuts in 2006. So now we're starting to see some young talent from Boston come out. And they've been waiting for these guys. They've needed players like this, and they're getting them, which is always exciting if you are a Red Sox fan. If you're not a Red Sox fan, well, I'm sorry. I'm not one either. Don't worry. I should say. <laughs> um, so with all these guys making their debuts, they were able to sign another well-known pitcher from the Japanese leagues named Dasuki Matsuka. So Dice K. He signs a massive six-year deal. And he doesn't pan out as well as they wanted him to, but he still has a couple key seasons in him. And they go on to win the 2007 World Series against the Colorado Rockies. So in the 2008, at the 2008 trade deadline, the team would wind up trading away a star named Manny Ramirez to the LA Dodgers due to a contract dispute. The Dodgers were ready to compete. They thought that they had a chance to win the uh, NL that year. So they tried to get him. They tried to get Manny. Manny wanted more money than the Red Sox were willing to pay him, so they got rid of him. But the 2000s were definitely a successful decade for the Red Sox as a lot of key players came into play. You know, at this point, you have an elite all-star closer in Jonathan Papelbon. You got one of the best starting pitchers in John Lester. You still have, you know, you have Dice K. You have one of your best second basemen, Dustin Madroya, and you went on to win two AL pennants and two World Series 2004 and 2007. So now we get to the 2010s, and 2010 itself wasn't a great season, but in 2011, prior to the season, the team made a huge splash in free agency when they signed first baseman Adrian Gonzalez and outfielder Carl Crawford to massive contracts. So what ends up happening is the Red Sox falter and they miss the playoffs. After 2011, this huge scandal comes out where basically Terry Francona leaves the team, Theo Epstein gets effectively traded to the Cubs. And uh, this the scandal that gets released is the chicken and beer scandal. So 
essentially, if you look at like the starters, the starting pitchers prior to the 2011 season and after the 2011 season, you'll notice they put on some weight. And I remember when the scandal started coming out, I'm like, really? And you look at the pictures and you see it. So the pitchers really started to struggle down the stretch when the Red Sox needed them to do their best. So basically what happened is it was found that the Red Sox starters were in the team clubhouse during the games, you know, relaxing, having fun, drinking beer and eating fried chicken. And if you're a major league baseball player, you shouldn't be doing that. So that upset a lot of people. Of course, Boston's a big media market. So it drew a lot of attention and it just, it was shocking. And what ends up happening is they, they start trying to, they trade a couple of the guys and they cut ties with them because they don't want to deal with it anymore. That's why they got rid of Francona. He got walked over. The starters let him do it. He let the starters do that. So now we get to the um, – do -do, sorry. Now we get to the 2013 season, and this is another interesting season. So as we know, in April of 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing would occur. Now, this was obviously a very heartbreaking act of terrorism that saw three people get killed and over a couple hundred get injured. And the Red Sox, the Bruins fell short in the 2013 playoffs, but the Red Sox took the rally, the rally cry, the battle cry of Boston Strong, and they really rallied behind it. So they took this Boston Strong and they took it, and they went straight to the World Series, and they won the World Series. Very emotional side for Boston fans. They were all excited, everything like that. And what happens before 2015, or dur during the 2014 season, an outfielder named Mookie Betts would make his debut. And before 2015, they tried to sign some uh, big-name free agents again for the second time in the decade. And this time it was uh, third baseman Pablo Sandoval and whatever you want to call him, first baseman, shortstop, designated hitter, Hanley Ramirez. Now, after 2016, David Ortiz would retire, and in 2017, the team would trade away Pablo Sandoval. Now, before the 2018 season, the team would sign an outfielder named J.D. JD Martinez, and J.D. really plays a key stretch, a key part in this team's history. So... What, what they end up doing is they go on to win the 2018 World Series. And this 2018 World Series is a controversial one. So we know about, we know the controversy. Of course, now there's accusations of sign stealing going on. It happened with Houston 2017 and Boston 2018. So a lot of people are saying that Boston's going to lose this World Series. There should be an asterisk by it. There won't be. But... It's, it's a big controversy. So in 2018, Mookie Betts wins the AL MVP award. And Boston, doing what it does best, misses the 2019 World Series. And here we are in 2020 at the point of this recording. They're in last place in the AL East. So in the 2010s, the Boston Red Sox won two AL pennants. And they won both of those World Series, 2013 and 2018. So as a whole... The Red Sox have won 14 AL pennants, nine of which have led to them winning the World Series. One World Series was not played, and then they lost four World Series. So all in all, that's a pretty impressive record. Um, so 42 players slash personnel with ties to the Boston Red Sox are inducted in the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, the Red Sox have 11 retired numbers, and those numbers are number one, Bobby Doerr, Number four, Joe Cronin. Number six, six Johnny Pesky. Number eight, Carl Yastrzemski. Number nine, Ted Williams. Number 14, Jim Rice. Number 26, Wade Boggs. Number 27, Carlton Fisk. Number 34, David Ortiz. Of course, number 42, retired Lee Ground for Jackie Robinson. And number 45, Pedro Martinez. So all in all, the Boston Red Sox have definitely had a very successful time as a franchise. Again, they won 14 AL pennants, nine World Series. The curse of the Bambino was lifted after 86 years. 
So Boston, definitely in a strong position. Uh, at this point in time, they are not looking that strong at this point in 2020. But they have a decent farm system. They have some strong corner infielders in their farm system. So Boston looks like it's ready to compete. Maybe not in 2021. But at the same time, Boston's a team that has money to throw around at free agents. We've seen it twice in the past decade. And it, it seems to work out when they go more for the minor leagues and the lesser name free agents. But we shall see. Again, that was the history of the Boston Red Sox. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, I'm very happy to have the history of series back in play. And again, don't be shocked if it takes a little bit before we have our next video of the history of series. We'll continue with the AL East. Uh, New York Yankees will be their own big, gigantic video. Don't worry. That's a real fun one. But again, hope you guys enjoyed this. Have a great rest of your day. Sarah, heading out. It's a pleasure to be back. I enjoyed it. Hope you guys did as well. Peace out.